Chapter 6 Kaoru was in a hospital room face to face with Ryonji, but his mind was on the sounds coming from the bathroom. Reiko had been in there for some time, with the water running. She wasn't showering, maybe she was washing underwear. While tutoring Ryonji, he'd seen Reiko hurriedly gathering up underwear that had been hung up to dry in the room. Distractedly, Kaoru set about answering Ryoji's questions about his father's condition. He gave him a brief rundown, but Ryoji's body language said he wanted to hear more. Maybe he wanted to sketch in the future of his own illness based on what he could learn of Kaoru's father. Kaoru stopped the conversation before Ryoji could start to guess that the cancer had spread to his father's lungs. Partly, he hesitated because he thought the knowledge might have a negative influence on Ryoji. But partly, he simply didn't want to say it out loud. When the cancer had become heavy on his lungs, Hideyuki's face had started to betray weakness. He'd started to talk about what would happen after he was gone, to talk about entrusting Kaoru with his mother's care. Look after Machi, okay? At the sight of this weakness... Kaoru was seized with a desire to deliver the full force of his anger upon his father. And just how am I supposed to comfort mom after you die? He wanted to say. Quit laying these impossible tasks on me! Now as he sat talking about his father's condition with Ryonji, also lying flat in a hospital bed, his father's image came to him, and he had a hard time speaking. Not noticing that Kaoru had fallen silent, and insensitive to the reason why, Ryoji produced a forced-sounding laugh. Now that I think about it, Kaoru, I talked to your father once. They'd both been in and out of the hospital with the same illness. No matter how big the hospital, it wasn't unlikely that they'd come into contact. Really? He's the tall guy in 7B, right? That's him. He's pretty strong. He's always frisky, slapping the nurses' butts and stuff like that. That was Hideyuki, all right. He'd achieved a certain notoriety among the patients for the cheerful way in which he battled his illness, never seeming to lose heart. They said that seeing him act so cheerful, so unafraid of death, made it possible for them to hang on to the hope necessary to gamble on long odds. He'd lost his stomach, his large intestine, and his liver and now it looked like the cancer had spread to his lungs. His time, it appeared, had come. But regardless, in front of other people, he put on a display of high spirits he couldn't possibly feel. The only exception was when he was alone with Kaoru. Then he allowed his weak side to show. What about your mom, Kaoru? How's she doing? Ryoji asked without much evident concern. Reiko came out of the bathroom, spread the laundry out on the extra bed, and then disappeared back into the bathroom. Kaoru followed her with his eyes, but the expected sound of running water never came. It seemed that Reiko just didn't want to be there, maybe because the topic of Kaoru's mother had come up. The metastatic human cancer virus can also spread through contact with lymphocytes, the attending physician had said. Kaoru's first fears had been for his mother. He imagined they'd ceased sexual relations as soon as they'd been made aware of the risk, but there was a good chance she'd already contracted it by that point. Recently, Kaoru had finally been able to prevail on his mother to have her blood tested. The results were positive. She had yet to manifest any symptoms but it was a fact that the MHC virus had already attached itself to her DNA. In other words, the retrovirus's base sequence had been incorporated into the chromosomes in her cells. At that moment, the process was paused at that step, but at any time her cells might begin to turn cancerous. In fact, there was every chance that it had already begun and it just wasn't yet apparent on the surface. The mechanism that determined when and how the provirus attached to the chromosomes would turn the cell cancerous was not yet understood, so the disease's progress from this point could not be predicted with any accuracy. 
But if it moved on to the next step, then his mother's cells would start producing new copies of the MHC virus. Even if I get sick, I don't want to have surgery, she proclaimed as soon as she'd heard the results. Since there was no way to head off metastasis, surgery was doomed from the start. All it could do was slow the progress of the disease, not cure it. After watching her husband suffer, she had a strong aversion to seeing her own body carved away piece by piece. But what bothered Kaudu most was seeing his mother stray into mysticism, thinking that if modern medicine couldn't cure her, she tried to find her own miracle elsewhere. The person she really wanted to save was not herself, although she knew she'd someday come down with cancer, but her husband, in the late stages of his. With a passion that wouldn't blink at selling her soul to the devil, she started reading old writings on North American Indians. Her desk was stacked high with primary sources sent from who knew where. The mythical world holds the key to a cure for cancer, she insisted, almost deliriously. Again from the bathroom came the purposeful sound of running water. Ryoji reacted by glancing toward the bathroom. My mother's a carrier, said Kaudu in a low voice. Oh, so are you... Ryoji asked his question with no emotion whatsoever, and Kaudu slowly shook his head. He'd had his blood tested two months ago, and the results had come back negative. Hearing this, Ryoji actually laughed. Not necessarily out of relief that Kaudu was uninfected, though. Rather, it was a scornful, even pitying cackle. Kaudu glared at him. What's so funny about that? I just feel sorry for you. For me? Kaudu pointed at himself, and Ryoji nodded his head twice. Yeah. You're strong and healthy, so you're probably going to live a long time. Just thinking about it. Under his motorcycle-loving father's influence, Kaudu had taken up motocross, and under Hideyuki's tutelage, he'd improved his showing with every race he'd entered. He'd grown up muscular and fit in a way that nobody could have predicted from a childhood spent on a computer from morning to night. Kaudu's muscles were visible even through his t-shirt, and yet this scrawny kid was pitying him. To Kaudu, it sounded like he was laughing at something Kaudu had inherited from his father, and he fought back vigorously. Living's not as bad a thing as you seem to think it is. Part of him could understand Ryoji's feelings, of course. Kaudu didn't know when or how he'd been infected, but here he was at age 12, between surgery, chemotherapy, and repeated hospitalizations. His life had been nothing but an endless round of suffering. Kaudu could see why he'd wanted to generalize from his experience and believe that everybody must be feeling the same way. Yeah, but everybody dies. Ryoji turned his hollow gaze toward the ceiling. Kaudu no longer felt like arguing with him. Death filled everything, everywhere. There in front of him was that bald little head. It was a solemn fact. Nobody who hasn't experienced it can understand the misery of chemotherapy. Overcome with violent nausea, you lose your appetite, and anything you do manage to eat, you bring up again soon enough. You can't get any sleep. That was Ryoji's life, and that was how his life was going to end in the not-too-distant future. Kaudu knew it. What could he possibly say in the face of that? Kaudu felt tired, not physical fatigue. It was like his heart was blocked and screaming. He wanted to soar. He wanted to laugh, freely and from the heart. He wanted to spend time in close bodily contact with another human being. I never wanted to be born in the first place, Ryoji said, ignoring Kaudu's unresponsiveness. At that very moment... Reiko stepped out of the bathroom and into the reverberations of Ryoji's statement. Without the slightest change in her expression, she crossed the room and went out into the hall. Why did you have me? Perhaps she left because she couldn't bear her son's accusations. Or perhaps she simply had an errand to run. 
there was no way of telling. But Kaoru had been paying attention to her movements. And now, two questions raised their heads. First of all, was Renko infected with the MHC virus? And, second, by what route did Ryoji become infected with it? These were questions Kaoru couldn't come right out and ask, as they touched on private family matters. Well, I think I'll be on my way now. He couldn't be by Ryoji's side any longer. Plus, he wanted to follow Renko. Kaoru left the boy's bed and opened the door to the hallway. He wanted to come into closer contact with Renko, both bodily and with what was inside her. Maybe his interest in her amounted to a kind of love. He couldn't tell. He felt that she was urging him out of the cramped hospital room and into the world outside. Compelled by this stimulus, Kaoru wandered the long corridors of the hospital, looking for Renko. <laughs>